The second part of this five point criteria is priority population groups. Now there are a number of population groups in our society that are at greater risk of disease and illness. We've mentioned the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group. We've also got low SES or low socioeconomic status, rural and remote communities, the elderly community, overseas born and the disabled. Now if we look at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities again and we think about their life expectancy gap, it's about 10.6 for males and 9.4 for females. That's quite a large gap. So it means that more resources and funding need to be allocated to the ATSI community so that their level of health can be brought up to the same level as the rest of the community. So clearly ATSI are a priority population group and there are a number of statistics there that tell the story. Again, we're seeing more statistics here for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group that show that they have seven times the amount of kidney disease in their population than the rest of the community. Uh, diabetes, 3.3 times the rest of the community, and the list goes on. And you can see that youth suicide is also very, very high. So again, a priority population group. Low SES are also a priority population group and there are clear differences between low and high SES when it comes to health outcomes. Interesting statistic is the, the daily smoking rate of 23% for low SES versus 10% for high SES. And of course we know that smoking contributes to a number of cancers and also cardiovascular disease. Rural and remote communities, the more remote an individual is, the more likely they are to experience disease and potentially um, a higher rate of, of death. And you can see in this particular graph that the more remote uh, communities are, the higher the death rate. Now, there are a number of risk factors for those that live in rural and remote communities. They're more likely to smoke on a daily basis, more likely to be obese, drink alcohol, be less active, and have high cholesterol. And they also are more likely to have a risky occupation. So clearly, rural and remote communities are a priority population group. Now, if the Australian government believes that the health issue can be controlled by meeting the needs of particular population groups, such as ATSI, low SES, rural and remote, overseas born, elderly and the disabled, then it's likely that the issue will be made a priority. The next step in the five-point criteria is prevalence of condition. Is there a high prevalence of the condition? This means how common is the condition? And if it is, then it's likely to become a priority. A lot of people in our community have cardiovascular disease, cancer, injury, dementia and diabetes and there are many others that are very common as well. So if, if a lot of people have the disease then it's likely the government will say let's make this a priority. If we look at cardiovascular disease a little more closely we can see that circulatory disease for example 3.7 million people in Australia are affected by it. Heart disease Again, 1.1 million people are affected. So this is a disease that has a very high prevalence. So it makes good sense to allocate resources, funding, education, to try to lower this so that the community is better off. So if the Australian government determines that there is a high prevalence of condition, then the issue will be made a priority. Moving on to the next step in the five point criteria is the potential for prevention and early intervention. Now, if there is a potential for prevention of a particular disease or early intervention to reduce its impact, then it's likely the government will make this condition a priority. For example, exercise, diet, and GP checkups can help to prevent cardiovascular disease from developing. And likewise, screening can prevent certain cancers from developing. Now, Breast Screen Australia is a government initiative. Now, mammography is the recommended screening tool for the early detection of breast cancer. And women aged 50 to 74 are invited to undergo free mammograms. And this program uh, reduces breast cancer mortality, that's death, by up to 28%. So therefore, we can intervene quite early with breast cancer and save someone's life. So it makes sense to allocate funding towards that so that we don't have a big mortality rate and we don't have a lot of people in hospital with advanced cancer. Now, if we have a look... Um, if the Australian government believes that there is potential for prevention and early intervention through exercise, GP checkups, vaccination, diet and surgery, then it's likely that the issue will be made a priority. Now the last factor in the five-point criteria 
is cost to the individuals and the community. Now, are there high costs to individuals and the community? Now, the government will need to consider this. Costs can be direct or indirect. They can be financial, physical, social, and emotional, and they affect individuals and the entire community. Now, direct costs is all about money. So in terms of an individual, it could be money spent on diagnosis, treatment, care, and prevention, but these costs can also be at a community level. So the costs estimated from medical services, the amount of people that are hospitalized and treated, uh, pharmaceutical prescriptions, prevention initiatives and campaigns, research, screening, and also education, this all costs money. And these are the direct costs of something like cardiovascular disease, for example. If it's costing the government a lot of money to treat, to put people in hospital, then it makes sense to put some strategies in place to reduce it and make it a priority. Now, you have a look at this graph and you can see that um, cardiovascular disease at the top, you can see the green part of the top bar is hospitalizations. Now, you can see that cardiovascular disease, it costs a lot of money to put people in hospital and treat it. Likewise for neoplasms, which is cancer, and also injuries. So you can see that hospitalizations cost a large amount of money. Now, the government then sees this information and says, right, we need to make these particular health issues a priority so we can lower the costs. Now, there are also indirect costs. Now, indirect costs relate to things like uh, having days off work or absenteeism, uh, lost earnings for people, retraining of replacement workers. So these can also be individual and they can also affect uh, the community. So an individual that has CBD may have to take time off work, it may affect the family, it may um, affect relationships and so on, uh, but it can also be at a community level. So insurance companies may be impacted, productivity in the workplace, support services may need to be developed to assist people that have these particular diseases. The workplace is affected and also wider communities are affected. So if the government believes uh, that health issues result in significant costs to individuals in the community that are direct or indirect, then the issue will be made a priority. Now, a quick summary. It's important that you understand that there are five factors in identifying priority health issues, and this is part of the five-point criteria that was discussed within this presentation. You also need to be able to argue the case for why decisions are made about health priorities and consider questions such as, how do we identify priority health issues for Australia's health? Again, the five-point criteria is there to help you understand the how. And what role do the principles of social justice play, participation, equity, access, and rights? And then finally, why is it important to prioritise? And consider the nine national health priority areas and why they are priorities. Thank you very much for listening.